guys been playing at all? We've, uh, yeah, we've gotten together. We've recorded, uh, we, we socially distance recorded demos. Mm -hmm. And then we were supposed to like the week all this went down, we were supposed to go to Malibu to start, start the record. Oh, really? But we have recorded some demos and um, I've been to see those guys twice and I'll be going again in the next week or so. Do you see me? There he is, he's back. You see me, oh my God, last time you guys were like, he's gone. And I was like, no, I'm not. And you were like, he did it again. And I was like, no. Oh God. All right. Well, it's like, like I was the host then. Yeah. It's Did it make you the host? host right on the thing. Yeah. Oh God, this, that's how we got this show. We were on somebody else's podcast and they made us host and we just took off with it. It's, uh, <laughs> well, um, we know the connection right. from Burbank is not that solid. So. <laughs> oh, you're in the Valley? Yeah. This is two Valley guests in a row, man. We had, uh, we had Trey on last time, man. <laughs> you're in the Valley. Ben, you're in the Valley. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not in the Valley. I'm in Hollywood, dude. Okay, they didn't film. Uh, least, I'm like Lucy. Silver Lake, where you can see it. Okay, okay, okay. It might look like I'm in the valley because I'm sweating bullets. Like it's ten degrees warmer here. But anyway, let's move on. Let's get out of this. Let's that get I'm started. This let's right. just get started. Yeah, sorry to our crowd. Okay. Are you rolling? Um, yes. Let's confirm that. Here, just one more time. Yes, I am rolling. Okay, I think we can just roll into this one. Okay. Let's do it. We're gonna we're gonna do the statement up front. Yeah. Sure. Let's do that. I'm Bob Crawford. I'm Ben Sawyer, and this is The Road to Now. Um, today, uh, we're recording this in front of one of our uh, live audiences here on Patreon. Um, June 14th, our guest for today, who we'll introduce in just a second, is uh, director, producer, extraordinaire, Michael Bonfiglio. Um, but before we started, in light of what's been happening, uh, we've been off the air for about two weeks now. And Bob and I just wanted to begin by uh, just saying that we stand with uh, we stand with the folks in the streets who are demanding justice. That we believe that uh, that this American promise that we were fortunate enough to have been at least told we had, uh, we believe in that, and we believe that we're the best when everyone has that opportunity. Uh, during the, the "I Have a Dream" speech, Martin Luther King as one of the favorite, the best lines I think I've ever heard in any speech, and it's where he says, we've come here today to cash a check. And what he meant by that was, we're not asking for something special. We're not asking for something we didn't earn. This was promised to us, and this country has not made good on that promise. So we stand here today, and now we're standing here, more than 50 years later, still saying we need to pay on that check. And I think it's time we do because we're all the best when the best of us can get to the top, so. Yeah, Ben, well said, and uh, I think if you look back to Reconstruction, you know, I had a great talk with our friend uh, Will Acuff last week, and, and uh, Will is just a fascinating guy. He, he uh, began a, a charity in Nashville, Tennessee called Corner to Corner, and uh, Will and his wife Tis Tiffany have been working for social justice for, uh, I mean, for a decade. Living um, for. Living, they're living social justice. They moved into one of the hardest neighborhoods in Nashville, not to change it, not to get a, a good deal on a house. Uh, no, no they, they, they moved in to become a part of the community. And um, we were, I was talking to Will and I was, you know, asking him, you know, as a, a man who has, uh, benefited from white privilege my whole life. You know, I, I, I've always been uh, progressive. I've always, uh, I've not seen race. I didn't grow up in a, a place where, um, I grew up at, uh, middle class to lower middle class. And I didn't, I just had friends. They're like I lived in a very mixed community, a very mixed neighborhood. And um, uh, so I didn't see race myself until I got a little older and there were troubles at my high school. Um, but I was racialized uh, in, by society. And, um, you know, because you don't see race, if you're white, you don't see race, right? right. You can decide when you see race. Well, race is something that other people are. Exactly. And you, you're just a person. Right. That's the way, that's the privilege. Exactly, exactly, Ben. So thank you so much for that. And so 
uh, I asked Will, I was like, well, Will, how, how do you um, suggest, wh what do you suggest that I do? Because I don't want to, uh, I don't, I feel like, I feel like I need to just shut up and get out of the way. Really, I need to shut up and get out of the way. And he said, uh, you know, if you're a Christian, repent, shut up and listen. And then you can help. And then you can help. After you listen, after you figure it out and like really understand what's going on, because your whole life you have not seen it, you have not experienced it. So you need to repent, <laughs> shut up and listen. And he said, if, and if you're not a Christian, you just shut up and listen. And so uh, uh, then, then Will and I talked about reconstruction and the fact that um, there were black senators in the South, you know, up until the Hayes Tilden election that pulled the troops out of the South. And that's what was that? Uh, well, 1870, 1877. But, but th there were still, they, they remained, uh, you know, black congressmen until 1901. And there were 20 members of the House who were black, and there were two senators, both from Mississippi. Um, and I tell my students this because I think so many of us believe this narrative that like civil rights was just like, well, you know, it's this, it's this, this myth of progress that we can only move forward. And I think that's why Reconstruction is such a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around, because it was this time when we moved forward, and then, and then violence broke that down. And so up until 1901, I tell my students this in, in, in my classes, and I say, are you, are you surprised? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what should actually shock you is that there were no m black members of Congress from his 30 years following that. That should surprise you. In 1870, almost 60% of the population of South Carolina was black. Think about that. I mean, you've got black majority populations in Mississippi and Louisiana. Why would you not expect that there would be any there'd be black folks in Congress. The fact that you could keep that many people down is the story you need to be following. And uh, it, it leads to some dark places, but like all, uh, like all parts of life, uh, you don't get better until you see the dark inside yourself and decide that you're gonna push past it. It's a really uncomfortable conversation to have, isn't it? But, but it's one we need to, to start having and we need to be able to see, um, see what we, we don't have to experience if you're white you don't have to experience any of this stuff i heard it i heard it on the radio this week uh someone there were uh some executives for a business having a meeting discussing how do we handle this how do we talk about it and the, one of the black executives said listen okay i got five speeding tickets you got five speeding tickets right but you were pulled over seven times and got five speeding tickets I was pulled over 40 times and got five speeding tickets. So anyway, that we just wanted to start off and kind of address this. Yeah. And I understand this. I mean, we, we come from a legacy where we're not really sure what to do with this, especially since, you know, right now we're coming at an era where we just had silence about this for so long. And we kind of had this, this steady hum of the idea that we had fixed this. And if it, if it wasn't better now, I guess that's other people's fault you know, in terms of like, well, I guess black folks haven't pulled themselves up. This is so blatantly wrong. And the history is time and time again, stacked against them. And um, it's just time to have an uncomfortable conversation. And I know that if you're white, this is uncomfortable to have a conversation about, but uh, I think it might spare another person from having to have an uncomfortable life in society. It's a, it's a hell of an even trade, if you ask me. Well, we stand with Black Lives Matter. Yep. Well, then. all right. So <laughs> let's uh, uh, hopefully Mike Bonifiglio is still here. Yeah, that well, was, yeah, it was great. I, 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 I went, went on mute because you guys are smarter than me and had a, far more articulate than what you were talking about. But I, I agree with, with you completely, you know, I, I, especially Bob, what you're saying about as a white man, it's time to just shut up and listen and, and, and get out of the way, yeah. you know, for once. It doesn't mean that, that we're, we can't support and we're not we're going to support our brothers Absolutely. and sisters but but we're going to look to them see so so this is the thing and ben i want to you know commend you on this idea and i think it'd be great if you shared it with everyone you know the so ben and i were like uh, you know last week we we're like we can't have a show we were going to do this but it just didn't 
feel right for any of us, for Mike or any of us to do this last week. And Ben had the great idea of handing over our show to someone else, right? Basically pass the mic. Pass the mic, literally. T tell us about it, Ben. So, can, so can the you want to, do you want to wait? I mean, no, no, know? I mean, I'll talk, we can talk about it now. Um, basically, okay. The idea was that like we have, what do we have to offer, right? So we all have to ask ourselves what we can do to fix this. There's gonna be no heroes in this. And in fact, the beauty of what's happening right now is that it's largely a leaderless movement in the sense that it's love and it's the spirit of equity, inequality that's driving people forward. There's no one has co-opted this yet. And that's beautiful. So we don't all have to be the leader, but we can lead and we can think about how we can help. And so I thought we have this, this great gift we have that we've built, which is our podcast feed. And our podcast feed, uh, when we put something on it, it just hit, hits thousands of people. And so I thought, what if we just gave our feed, what if we just offered our feed to, to some, some brilliant black voices in our lives and let them decide, just step out of the way, say, we will support you. You need technology, you can borrow technology. You need, you need tips on editing. Like I'm basically, I'll be your producer. I'm editing your episode. You, well, I'll work for you now. So what do you want to do? And that's what we've been doing. And uh, so look for that on the feed. And one of the things that's important, if you're wondering why it wasn't like we didn't just have someone on, uh, to, simply, uh, I think uh, there's, there's been enough of white folks asking black folks, folks questions, right? I think it's time to let them pose the questions. I think it's time to let them give their voices. And so we hope you guys will support us in this and that you'll take the time to listen to these episodes as they come out. Yeah, and RTN Theology is following Ben's lead, and we've given uh, over our reins to uh, the great Liz Weiss. So, um, so you guys are in for a treat. And it was like, Liz, it's your show. You have on whoever you want. We're going to support you any way that you need that support. And so uh, this is the last thing I'm going to say on, on this issue, on Black Lives Matter issue, is that, um, look, I look at it like it's, it's racial... The race issue is about power, right? It's the power dynamic, right? And the power dynamic for 400 years has been white over black. And the only way, and I've heard other anti-racists say this, and that's why I'm saying it. Um, and I wish I could quote the, the gentleman I listened to a wonderful podcast about two years ago about this, but it's the matter of giving over, we need to let go of power. Is what basically, to make this right, we need to, you need to be able to let go of the power that you have because you're white. Yeah. And that's all I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, just to be clear, uh, black folks, I'm ready to listen to you. White folks trying to defend the Confederacy, kind of sick of you, honestly. Uh, would, uh, would love, I've been thinking about this for a while, but I'm just feeling a little froggy right now. So I will say, if you think that the Civil War was not about slavery, have me on your show. <laughs> have me on your show. Let's talk tired of writing everybody dms about this uh let's uh let's talk about it so anyway yeah the uh the that north i took north american history class uh probably this time last year and and we got to the civil war and and the peter van cleve the professor's like civil war is about slavery end of the story full stop that's it it was about slavery that's it people are going to try to say i teach this all i teach this for years i say it it rolls their eyes. They argue. No, civil war was about slavery. That's it. And I'd like to recommend everyone this vast Southern Empire Park great book. I tweeted about it the other day because you can't like you like you said you can't DM everybody or respond and have these complicated threads about this. Ah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mike Bonifiglio. Hey guys, thanks for having me. And Bob, can you, can you repeat the name of that book? I think it cut out. Yeah, I think it's called This Vast Southern Empire. And I will, I will uh, get that right because basically Carp makes the argument that the foreign policy of the United States for the first, was it up, in, up until the 1850s, was all about slavery and expanding slavery throughout the world. And we think of slave uh, plantation owners and, and slave owners as being these uneducated, you know, dumb Southerners, but they were very sophisticated, very intelligent. Uh, they had their, their, the market, it was all about the market and it was about making money and, and uh, you would have women, 
a Southern women, there was a culture of Southern women fantasizing about owning slaves. And there was just this crazy, as extensive a culture. I mean, if you're into bass fishing, you can belong to the group, you can buy the magazines, you can watch the shows on YouTube. It's a culture, right? If you're a fisherman, there's a culture to it. If you like to play golf, there's a culture to it. If you like um, gory movies, right? Uh, uh, horror films, there's a culture to it. Like anything we do, there's a culture that we can surround ourselves in, anything that we're into. Well, for slave owners and for Southerners who, who fantasized about being slave owners, there was a culture. There were newspapers, there were, you know, entertainment, there were songs. It, it just, it just, it boggles, it's, it doesn't, it shouldn't boggle the mind, but you're reading this book and the research is incredible. Um, and it's just, it's pretty disgusting, but it's, it is so, so real. It's so real. We need to be awake to it. Um, anyway, Matthew Carp, and I will get this to everyone by the end of this show. Michael Bonfiglio, our opening question was going to be how has uh, the, the, the crisis that we're going through right now, uh, originally it was going to be, you know, the, uh, the, the coronavirus outbreak, how has it affected your work? But I think that maybe we won't quit talking long enough to let you do that. So I think <laughs> de facto we're the third wave of shutdowns in your life. So let's just go with this, man. You're a director, you're a producer, you are an incredible storyteller and, um, Hey Bob, I'm getting your tapping on the on the. Uh, you all are. Oh man, I'm trying to talk to the people here. Okay, I'll um, stop. So I'll start over. Michael Bonfiglio, you are an incredible director. You are a producer. You have worked uh, apparently one time in your life. You worked cameras. Uh, you you've done a lot of things, and you do them really well, which is what's insane. I will say, I will preface this by saying uh, this week's research, instead of being reading books like it normally is, was me and my wife watching your documentaries. And it was awesome because I already seen a couple. Um, but let's just go into this. Like how, you know, for real, how, how has this, uh, this current crisis disrupted your work and, uh, and, and just your daily routine as a filmmaker? Yeah, I mean, in, in just about every way, um, it, it, it's changed. Um, you know, we, I, I live in New York, um, and my wife and I, at the end of March, uh, found a house to rent up in the country, and, and we've, we've been up here really ever since. Um, and because, you know, the office is shut down, our edit rooms shut down, shooting has completely stopped, except in certain special cases. So, you know, I, I was, I tend to work on a couple of things at the same time because of the way that documentary often, you're doing different parts of the process at different times so you can juggle a few things at once and um, you know one project that I was deep in the edit on and we were not quite done shooting we had to put on hold and we're trying to figure out how to how to move ahead with that we will but it but it's gonna probably look different than than we had expected um, another project that we were initially planning on shooting we're trying to figure out a way to do it without any filming at all um, and using other techniques to, to try and tell our story. Um, but it's, it's definitely for myself and other people in the industry, um, it's been, you know, it's scary. We don't know what the future holds, just like in, in any industry. Um, and yet stories still want to be told, need to be told. Um, people need to be entertained. Um, you know, that's certainly, there's no shortage of, you know, people watching stuff during this. Um, yeah. so, you know, I, I don't think it's a medium that's going to disappear. You know, I'm very lucky in that, that I, I don't think my job will be eliminated um, by this. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of parts of the process that are very, very collaborative and the way that creativity often happens among collaborators. Being in the same room together is really helpful. Um, Bob, I'm sure, you know, with, with the band, it's like, you know, yeah. songwriting and arranging and all of that stuff and performing. It's there's an alchemy when when you're with your collaborators and and ideas are flowing and um and also with documentary with subjects you know it's it's a huge thing so we're still navigating it i i haven't shot anything since uh you know sometime in march um and and so so yeah it's it's a it's a, a definitely a, a scary uh time in terms of how we're going to move forward we will you know as will everyone um but I think there are going to be some changes that are going to 
stay permanent from things that we've learned through this, from things that the people who control the budgets have learned <laughs> through the, you know, through this process. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully some good will come out of it, but I, I think we're going to be stuck with some things that we're not as happy about and we're going to have to learn new ways of working. Um, so, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Bob, sorry about that. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, I, you know, I read, uh, uh, you know, I read, the, not, I don't read the trades, but I, but I do read like some entertainment media and I did notice in the back past couple of weeks, your name being mentioned on two new projects that Judd Apatow has in the works. One of them is a George Carlin documentary. Yes. And then the other is a Ricky Valletta's stand-up special. So right. wh how, how are these going to proceed? So now these have been announced. Right, so but is it like something you're going from Patrice O'Neill to George Carlin? That's not even fair. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's I, I'm I'm extraordinarily uh, lucky is the only word I can can put it. Privileged and lucky. Um, the well, the Ricky Vlad special we were we were supposed to shoot that in May was our plan. We had a place lined up. We were excited to do it. Ricky was ready. His set is fantastic. Um, and then this happened. Um, and so, uh, in fact, the, the last time I saw Ricky in person, we were going to look at, at the space that we were planning on doing it in. And we did, you know, one of the elbow mm -hmm. handshakes in early March. And um, so we're, we're working on how to, how to make that happen. Um, our old plan is not going to work and we've got to come up with a new one, um, which we're, we've been diligently trying to, to figure out. Um, and then the George Carlin film, you know, that's, we haven't even begun work yet. Um, that, that actually, I think, was sort of accidentally announced by Judd when he was doing an interview uh, for his new movie, The King Staten Island, which is great, by the way. I urge everybody to see it. Um, so, you know, that will get underway soon. Um, obviously, that's a world where there's a lot of archival material, a ton of archival material, and Carlin himself left behind so much. So hopefully we'll be able to lean on that um, and have him tell his own story as much as possible. Um, but yeah, there's the, it, it's, it's, it's exciting to have new things on the horizon. Um, it, but there's challenges to figuring out how to, how we're going to pull it off. Yeah. It's, it strikes me that you are a documentarian and if you kind of step back, you go, all right, this guy makes documentaries. But I, the, the interesting thing that I want to know is, you know, historians will talk to people that do like more recent history or historians. And it's kind of like, whoa, 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 you got to work with people who are still alive. That must be hard, huh? They're like, yeah, but I got to get at the documents. But you both have to work with people who are alive and creating, still creating the narrative of who they are. And now you're stepped into working with people who have passed away and, and, and shaping their legacy. Um, what are the challenges that come with each one? Or do you find more similarity or, or does that really challenge you going back and forth? It's it's well the going back and forth is isn't um, as difficult as the, the different challenges that the two ideas or the two the two forms kind of present. You know, um, there have been so many times I'm working on this film as you said about Patrice O'Neill, and there there's so many times as we're going that I'm just saying I wish Patrice was here so I could ask him about this and get what he really meant here, or has his thought on this idea changed? in the past, you know, 10 years, um, and, and you can't. And so all you can do is try and be responsible and be as truthful as you can to what that person was about or what you, your impression of, of it. I mean, there's a part of documentary that I think, and it depends on the, the type of film. I think there are certain films that, that require a different level of responsibility than others. Um, and I think certainly when you're talking about somebody who can't respond for themselves, who's dead, um, there's a different type of responsibility that goes along with that. Um, because you're presenting something to people um, that it can, while it can be corrected by, by some people, it's, it's debatable in some senses what, what the, the truth is. Um, in a situation where the people are living, not only are you able to um, try and draw out of them whatever uh, whatever is the truth, but you can present them um, in a way that, can, that allows the audience to know whether or not you think that they're being truthful, if that makes any sense. 
Um, for example, like when we were doing May at Last with you guys, Bob, um, you know, which is still to this day the most joyous experience I've ever had making a film. And I just, I, I, all of us who worked on it just, uh, we, we cherished the experience we had making it. We're very proud of what we made. You know, but, but it was, I, the intent there was to try and capture some truth about you guys in that moment during or that two and a half years that we spent making it with you. But what's the truth of, of right now? You know, and that if, if you guys can go out and give interviews and, and say different things than you said during May at last. And, um, and that's fine because things evolve and change. But of that moment, I hope that what we presented was truthful, was an accurate and truthful reflection of what you guys were about in that time. You know, um, so it's it, it's definitely um, it, it's different types of challenges, and I think different layers of responsibility. It's also I, I think you're you're not carrying as much of a burden on your shoulders when you're telling a story about a band that's you know around and can answer it for themselves, and if you're making a film about something political, a social issue. Um, where you might be changing people's minds or turning them on to an idea um, that really affects their lives in the immediate. Um, and, and there's a different level of responsibility there um, that, that you always have to take very seriously. So maybe talk about that for a second because you made the Cole documentary. Yeah. What was yeah. the title? From the Ashes. The, from, the ashes. from the Ashes, right. Uh, and actually, you connected connected us to Chuck Keeney, which yeah. still to this day is one of our most popular episodes. Yeah, it is. He's great, um, isn't he? Yeah. So, so I'm still waiting on that check, Bob, for the uh, for the referral of that guest. It's uh, I. You know what? When you go back to New York City, it's it's there. It's there. I sent it to. I didn't know you moved out for the for the COVID thing, and so I sent it to your house. So it'll Thanks. be. You'll you'll go back in six months, and it'll be there. Yeah. So um, that gives me six months to get the check there. Uh, <laughs> but what's the difference between, because because people don't realize you guys shot all day with us for two yeah. and a half, you know, for two years or whatever it was. I mean, all day long. So, you know, you're sifting through all this material of us and you're finding a narrative in there, right? right? But then you've got the history of coal in the United States and and you're finding it, there's a narrative there to tell. So what's the difference? What are a few, a few of the difference of, of sifting through all of the material to find that, that thread that creates that narrative? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, it's very different. And again, it is also that, that responsibility. You know, if we, if we were wrong about something in, in your film, you know, in May at Last, if, if something was wrong, well, okay, that bad on us, but it's, it's not really going to affect something. If we're wrong about a statistic or a piece of information that we're putting forth in, from the ashes, that's a lot more important in a way. You know, that, the, the, the audience is gonna come away with the wrong impression about an important issue that affects people that may affect the way that they think, the way that they vote, um, the, the politicians who they support. Um, and so there, it, the other thing too about about the sort of the truth of it is with may at last we had no agenda going in i had no idea of what it was going to be about. well you didn't know what you're doing right like we, you didn't, know what we didn't even know we were making a film <laughs> we were just coming to shoot a little bit and see if there was something there um and so you guys told us what the film was without ever having that conversation but just in observing you and 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 seeing what was going on in your lives seeing how you interacted with one another that told me what the film was about. Uh, with From the Ashes, we knew going in, when we were going to speak to somebody, we knew what they were gonna tell us. We knew uh, what point of view they had and what they would um, be bringing to the conversation. You know, um, The goal of that film was to raise issues, to bring information to people and let them make their own decisions about how they felt about policy. Um, so, you know, we, we had statistics, we were armed with statistics going in with From the Ashes. Um, and we relied heavily on statistics while we were cutting the film. Um, and then the challenge in a film like that is to make it entertaining. You know, how, how is it 
different from, you know, why, could, why couldn't you just read this in an article in a couple of pages with some charts and graphs? And so my challenge, and I'm not a policy expert by any stretch of the imagination, um, I'm not really an expert in anything. Um, but so in that film, it was, my job was to listen to the people who were experts um, and to synthesize that information into personal storytelling through the characters and understand emotionally how these issues were affecting them so that an audience could connect. And then those statistics and charts and graphs mean something because it's about how it's affecting this individual in Dallas whose kid has asthma and how <clears throat> these decisions that we make about, about environmental policy and energy policy um, are affecting these, these kids. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very different process. Um, and part of it too has to do with the, the form. You know, what we were doing in May at last was kind of classic cinema verite, like letting it all just unfold and capture it and then shape that into a story that, that is hopefully entertaining and moving and involving for an audience. Um, whereas the other, the, From the Ashes is much more of, a, of, of an essay film. Where, where you're trying to just impart knowledge and information and, and less uh, heart and emotion. Um, but it's, you know, finding that balance. Where do you find the universal threads? Like, what do you think works best? Because, I mean, you know, when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with coal, those interviews you did there in coal country, um, I mean, you're, you're talking about a group of people that have been dismissed. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find a way to essentially bring, like bring those people who have already been marginalized into the life of a viewer of a documentary and make them connect. What, where do you find that? Is, is there kind of a formula for that? Or do you, is everyone nuanced? How do you approach it? I think everyone's nuanced. And part of it, you know, the big decisions in, in a situation like that is deciding beforehand who the people are that you're going to talk to. You know, we didn't just show up in West Virginia and say, okay, who wants to talk? You know, we had producers for- <laughs> That's a different years. documentary. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, I've done that too, and it never works. It just, you don't, you know, you can do the man on the street thing and talk to 40 people and none of them really have that much to say and they're not compelling people. We, we you know, our, our producers found compelling people with things to say and with, with strong feelings and who were in, situations that um, the, the coal issue was affecting their lives directly. So um, how do they find those people? How do they locate those people? Well, all different ways. Um, sometimes it's, hey, my cousin knows somebody who knows somebody and they've got this great story. Sometimes it's um, somebody who's done an interview somewhere else, you know, and, and, and they've become uh, like in, uh, in, from the ashes, the, the women in, um, in North Carolina, actually, who um, were fighting the coal ash mm -hmm. uh, issue with, with Duke Energy, they had done a bunch of interviews. They, they had a, a, a local media presence. Um, and so we spoke to them and they were great. And so we filmed more with them. Um, so, uh, you know, nowadays, a lot of casting happens, you know, documentary casting uh, happens over, over social media, over, over, Facebook and things like that. Um, but it's, uh, and, and then sometimes you kind of put out casting calls, oh, th usually through social media nowadays. I mean, I, back when I started, um, I remember putting ads in the back of the Village Voice um, looking for, for people for projects, you know. Um, now it's mostly just online, you know. But, but um, and then you have, to, you have to vet the people, not only for that they're legit, but also that they are what we tend to call TV ready. You know that they are comfortable on camera, that they are articulate, that they are compelling in some way, um, and, and then that that helps an audience to connect. You know, there are certain qualities, some that you can describe, and some are just you can't really put your finger on it, but just that person pops on screen, and those are the people that we're looking for. So you you said the words back when I started. So let's talk about back when you started. What got you into making documentaries and what were some of the documentaries that you saw as a younger guy that, 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 that really sparked something in your brain and, and said, I want to do this. For me, it was, it was one film called Brothers Keeper, um, which I don't know if anyone uh, out there has seen it. If you haven't seen it, see it. It's, it's still my favorite documentary of all time. Uh, it's from 1992. 
uh, Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sanofsky made the film. Um, and it was, you know, I grew up in a really small town in central New York State, a town called Clinton. And uh, we didn't get art movies. We didn't get anything that was off the beaten path whatsoever. Me and my friends had to really seek out anything that was outside of the mainstream. And um, this film, Brothers Keeper, happened to have been shot about 15 minutes from where I grew up, from my hometown, in a town called Munsville, New York. Um, and so because of that, there was local interest and the filmmakers, Joe and Bruce, um, were self-distributing the movie. They had brought it to Sundance, it won an award and didn't get picked up for distribution. So they distributed it themselves. And one of the places they brought it was right near my hometown. So I went to go see it in a little movie theater called the Paris Cinema. It's not there anymore in Hartford, New York. Um, my mom and I went and uh, I was in high school. And one of the directors was there, Joe, uh, uh, Bruce Sanofsky. And he spoke afterward. And I, after the movie, I met him in the lobby and introduced myself and said, you know, I want to be a filmmaker. At that time, I wasn't interested in documentary until that night. Um, I just wanted to be a filmmaker. The, Martin Scorsese was my hero. And I, you know, that I, I wanted to make narrative films. And, uh, and I met Bruce and he was really cool and really nice. And I'd never met a real filmmaker before, you know, from this little town and no connection to show business at all. And met this guy and he was super nice to me. Um, so a couple of weeks later, I read in the paper that he was coming back to present the film again. And I remember I, I, I was in high school, I cut class and I took the bus down and saw it the second time, loved it again. Um, and was just so moved by the way they presented these people who were kind of marginalized and they imbued everyone in the film with such humanity that I, it just, uh, and it, it reflected people that I knew, you know, not literally knew them, but the, the, these were the kinds of people that I grew up with and, it, and they just captured it so beautifully um, and created a really compelling story in a documentary format. And um, so I met Bruce a second time and uh, I, I said, you know, I want to be a filmmaker. I'm hoping to move to New York one day. And he said, well, if you ever move to New York, look me up. I'm in the phone book. So. Um, finished high school it's sort of a long story but that that was no that, that's what we're, we're on here to do long stories so you yeah, finished no, high school I, and, and so I finished high school I uh, I did a, a gap year in Brazil um, and I had gotten into NYU film school so I started my freshman year and um, it was toward the end of my freshman year that Joe and Bruce's second film which is called Paradise Lost about the uh, West Memphis three uh, murder case in um, in Arkansas that was playing at the uh, the new directors new new films series at, at the Museum of Modern Art. I saw it, you know, saw it in the paper that it was playing, and it's oh my gosh, those guys who made this film that I love. I, I literally had a Brother's Keeper poster in my dorm room oh, that, that Bruce had signed for me. I still have it. Um, and uh, oh, these guys have a new movie out, so I went to the Museum of Modern Art, and I was dumb and didn't know that the new directors new film series sells out immediately, um, like weeks before. And so I got up to buy a ticket and they're like, this is completely sold out. So I started to walk away and I saw Bruce in the lobby, this guy I'd met about four years before. So I just went up to him and I said, hi, I, you know, I'm sure you don't remember me, but I you know, met you a few years ago at Brothers Keeper and, and he could not have been nicer. He was like, of course I remember you, which I, I don't believe he did, but he, he said he remembered me, he gave me a ticket to the movie. He introduced me to Joe, his, his filmmaking partner, um, and uh, I saw the movie, it blew me away. It's an incredible, incredible film. Um, and then I, I talked to him after and I said, if you're ever looking for free work, I, I'll intern for you. And uh, they hired me. So I started interning for them in my, my sophomore year of college and then ended up uh, dropping out of school to, to be their full-time paid assistant at the end of my sophomore year of college, yeah. And they did the Metallica documentary. They did the Metallica documentary, yes. Yeah, some kind of monster, um, which you, I worked on. Uh, you ran the, film, you so ran the cameras on that, right? I'm sorry? You ran cameras on that, right? Uh, I don't think I did. I might have, there might have been one scene that I, I had a, a camera, I think maybe when we were in Europe, I, I, I shot part of a scene or something, but I, I did not, not really, I wouldn't. I don't think I did. I may have a credit because I, I held the camera once and it ended up in the movie, but but I didn't let, really. No. Let me just say that anybody who directs a Metallica documentary and it's kind of fuzzy what happened, they definitely 
directed and worked <laughs> on or worked on a Metallica documentary. <laughs> this was long after their partying days. It was, uh, yeah. But yeah. Mike, how did you meet Judd? I met Judd um, in 2012. I, I was working on a show for Sundance Channel called Iconoclasts. Oh, wow. I love that show. Oh, yeah. You yeah, wrote the really episode cool. about the assassination wow. attempt on McKinley, right? Well, I'm sorry, you cut yeah, out. Yeah, you're breaking up. Ben. What, what was it? Sorry. This, this is, I'm going to pull this out now because this was a spoiler, but didn't you write, co write an episode on the McKinley assassination for that series? That was, that was for a different thing. That was for. That was for 10 days that unexpectedly changed America. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Sorry. Um, but I did, I, I did do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I met, I, I met Judd on the show called Iconoclast where it was basically you take two uh, well-known people from right. different disciplines. And they Dave Chappelle and Maya Angelou. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I had done some producing on that show. I, I produced an episode with uh, Laird Hamilton and Eddie Vedder. That was really fun to do. Um, Gosh, I did a couple of others uh, that, I, that I produced. And then I came on to direct um, in the, what ended up being the final season of the show uh, in 2012. And a great series. A great series. Really great. Yeah, there's a lot of good episodes. I, I don't know if you can find, I mean, there's probably bootlegs on YouTube. Um, but uh, Judd was, uh, was the subject and I was directing it. And so I met Judd, it was with Judd and Lena Dunham. This was just before the first season of Girls came out. I remember that episode, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I met Judd on that. And we just really hit it off. And um, he was very happy with what we did with the show. And we kind of just kept in touch. And um, kept saying, you know, saying, oh, you know, let, at some point, let's, let's do something together. And we talked about a couple of different ideas. And um, one idea that we had was, was to do a show kind of profiling different, um, it, artists of, of different kinds and that's what may at last started as is that we thought maybe this could be a pilot for this for this show idea that we kind of <laughs> have to reform but we don't a know two and a half year pilot that's amazing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when's the next episode coming out yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, after, and after may last Joe was like okay uh that's not gonna work okay, right. <laughs> oh, we got an order for 26 more of these let's get going I, I'll bet he's forgotten that that, that that was how it started, but that was the initial idea was maybe this could be a pilot. So wow. it was when we, that first shoot with you guys in, in North Carolina in Jan, I want to say January, 2013 was, um, you, you know, we just came down for a few days and thought, well, maybe we can make this into something. And then it took us forever to figure out whether, what it was because there was nothing happening. You I'm guys all got like six along. months into it, Judd being like, uh, uh, "Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we'll just keep. We'll just keep doing this. Yeah, just keep doing this. Like, <laughs> there was just something about it, about the, about you guys, and about the material that we were getting, and the music, and and it was just, we don't know what this is, but we should just keep going. And 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 Judd was was paying for it. I was working for free. We just were doing it out of something compelling us to to keep going. And um, I think it was right before you went to Malibu that we said, I think this is a movie. And, and because I think we, we spent a lot of time waiting to waiting for the conflict, you know, because what you want, you think what you want. Yeah, you gotta fight. You gotta fight. The fighting. Yeah, but yeah, like some kind of monster. Those, bro those fighting, brothers need to be uh, hands on each other's necks, you know? Right. Yeah. And then, and then what we realized was, no, that's, that's exactly not what this means. This is about how people get along and love and respect each other and how interesting that is and how beautiful that is. And that's what the film ended up being about, you know, but it took us a long time to, to kind of get out of that way of thinking of, of you know, conflict equals drama and, 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 and it's, it's not true. Yeah, that, that time that you came up to me in the studio and you were like, go punch Scott, just go punch him. <laughs> just, like, uh, I never really hit anybody, Mike. I, I don't know. Uh, really if like, you think it'll right, work, right, if, you, if, if it'll help, yes. <laughs> all right, everybody, when they go to sleep, let's go in there and eat the last cookies. And when they wake up tomorrow, <laughs> like kind of insinuate that the other one did it. We'll get them fighting each other. It's like, damn it, man, it's just a documentary about how nice they are. I, a I, disappointed I, look. You, you I had no a disappointed look. <laughs> I also love that you guys shot for years before you figured out that they're like, that they ridiculously well merge with each other. 
because well, I don't know, like I've been observing these guys forever and it was like, Hey man, I'm going to come down and see a show, man. You guys want to hang out afterwards? And they're like, oh, I got a good bit. It's nine 30. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> I remember like, like in those years of my life, like the most precious times were the times Bob would stay up to like 10 and have a beer with me after the show. <laughs> All right, man. I'm just real happy to see you. I'll stay up till 11. <laughs> Bob kept on like accidentally giving me the wrong hotel and stuff like that. It was odd, but yeah. I always found him. Um, yeah. Well, it took us a while to figure out that, that you guys weren't just putting it on for us, that, that we were actually getting the real thing. I, I remember saying to like to Mike Marsh being like, are these guys for real? Are they this is just for the cameras, right? You know, and, and it's like, no, no, this is, and you know, obviously we spent so much time together that it was very clear that, that what you guys have is so special and, and beautiful. And, and that's what we wanted to, to document. The first day um, of the next recording session, when you guys weren't there, it was like somebody was missing. Where oh, really? Mike and, and every, where's Jonathan? Where is everybody? Where are they? You know, it it's just so felt- sweet to hear. It felt weird to, to be there without you guys. Um, let's talk well, about- Sunday sequel. Well, yeah. At, we'll at the, uh, we said 10 years at the, um, the uh, what was the film festival in North Carolina, Full Frame. And Scott was there and afterward we looked at each other, all right, in 10 years, we got to do the sequel. <laughs> well, we're getting close, aren't we? Yeah, like, probably. And we have, by the time with the COVID stuff, you know, oh. it's, it'll be there before we know it. Uh, and your beard will be very, very It'll long. Really, <laughs> well, Rick and I will uh, compete. <laughs> You'll be the same guy. Also. Uh, so tell us about, you know, maybe the Ava brothers are really sweet and, and the goodness of people and, and uh, just a, a, a unique kind of goodness, right? Um, what about the Doc and Daryl documentary? That, that's, that's a great um, segue. Um, and uh, what I was saying before about how you can present truth in different ways when you have living subjects. You know, um, with Doc and Daryl, we discovered partway through filming that we did not believe that we were being told the truth about things. And so we were faced with some really difficult decisions as filmmakers and, you know, um, had to decide first of all whether we keep going you know we thought we were doing one thing and it turned out we were we were doing something else and and, had, and, and just for our listeners it's yeah. dwight gooden and daryl strawberry from from the mets yes yeah so yeah I'll, I'll just give a little backstory because I'm, I'm assuming people have seen it but they probably haven't uh, it was a 30 for 30 film that um judd and i did together uh about let's say four years ago or something we actually started it uh about five months into filming may at last and we finished it about a year and a half before we finished May at Last. So, so while we were doing May at Last, we made Doc and Daryl. Yeah, as it turns out, the conflict was way easier to find. Uh, Much easier to find. Around. Yeah. A lot more ups and downs and debauchery and all the things that, that we couldn't find in the Abbots, we found with Doc and Daryl. Uh, and, you know, basically the two baseball players who are, um, you know, were very early on massive stars, um, incredibly talented, um, but they both uh, struggled terribly with, with drug and alcohol addiction and other demons. And, um, you know, we th- went into it thinking that we were making a film about two people who had kind of been through hell and come out the other side. And partway through filming, we realized that that might not be the case, um, that, that there was still a lot of turmoil there. And so we had to decide first off whether or not we wanted to keep going, um, whether it felt like that was the film we wanted to make. And if it was, how do we do it? Um, You know, when you don't believe one of your subjects, when somebody's telling you something about themselves and you have other evidence that suggests otherwise, um, and there's also sometimes just something in your gut that just doesn't register. But in this case, we, we had strong reason to believe that that stuff that was being told to us was not really the the full picture. Um, And so we worked really hard, um, not only behind the scenes with that subject, trying to get that person some help so that we could make a different film. Um, And we could make the film about somebody who had come through the other side, Um, but we got a lot of resistance and um, refusal 
to uh, acknowledge what was really going on. So ultimately, we had to try and calibrate the film to reflect the idea that, hey, maybe this, maybe this is, you're not hearing the truth. You know, maybe there's, there's more to it here. And it's up to you, viewer, whether you believe what this person is telling you. Um, and, uh, you know, as it turned out, we, we were correct, um, which we knew, um, but it was, it was, it was very difficult. And it was very emotional and, um, it kind of made you question what it was you were doing, you know, because to out somebody as a drug addict is not something that we wanted to do. Um, we didn't want to harm them or their livelihood or anything like that. Um, but we also had a responsibility to our audience. And so we, we chose a, a path of, instead of getting explicit about what we believed, um, we decided to just allow those questions to, to be raised and, um, you know, not put somebody in a, in a position that they could harm them um, or their reputation, but also not, not buy what they were telling us and not allow, not present to the audience a version of truth that we didn't feel was, was the truth. There's um, a, a scene in that, I think that does it, like amazingly and it's the same it's kind of i feel like watching it it's where you kind of hit you that not everything's okay it's the interview with with dwight gooden's mother mm -hmm. and you say how's he doing and she says he tells me he's doing okay i'm, I'm glad you picked up on that because that is the first moment in the film that you get a sense of that maybe maybe this isn't you know maybe we're not hearing the truth here from from dwight himself you know um, the deadline and, broke my heart, man. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was very difficult to, cause at that moment, cause I, I actually shot that, that was one that I did have the camera. Um, I, I shot that moment myself. And, uh, and at that point I, I did know that, um, that Dwight was not clean, you know? Um, and, uh, he was telling everyone that he was, and, and, and we knew that that was not the truth. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, it was his mom, you know, she was an old lady. I wasn't going to give her the third degree. I just wanted to, what do you think? You know? And I, I generally think, you know, unless it's um, a very issue specific kind of a film, um, if it's more of a human story, like what we were trying to tell with Doc and Daryl or with May at Last, it's let, let the, let your subject speak for themselves, give them space to, to, to express themselves the way they want to express themselves and you can shape that you know but but be true to what they're what they're trying to say when you're making a documentary what are some of the ways you use b-roll footage or uh, imagery to assist the narrative or or to uh, support the narrative but not to but not um like you talked about you know you kind of wanted to let you know let the the Doc and Daryl speak for themselves, you know, Dwight Gooden speak for himself and let the question hang out there and, and the, you know, people being interviewed. Um, but but what, what are some of the ways, I'm I th thinking about editing is what I'm, I'm kind of getting at. Yeah. And as a director and a producer, how much lev leeway do you give the editor to shape the viewer's understanding of the film in in the in the, in the in the ways that are unspoken, that makes um, sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, the collaboration with the editor is is a huge, um, very very important collaboration. And um, you know, when I work with with an editor, you know, we we talk beforehand, we talk all the time during. Very often, I'm just in the room with them as those decisions are being made, and I'm telling them what to do. Other times, they're presenting me with things, and I'm commenting on it. Um, so, you know, the editor is doing, they're, they're doing a huge part of the storytelling along with you. Um, but as the director, you have the, it's your job to either say, yes, I like that. That's great. Boy, does that make, make me look good as a director? Cause you just did it. Um, or, Hey, let's, let's shift this a little bit. Let's, you know, that when you talk about, um, you know, B-roll or a cutaway to, to an image, there's a lot of power that we have um, that can put ideas into an audience's head that even just, you know, a little cutaway um, can make something funny. It can make something sad. It can make you question what you're being told. Um, it can add beauty to it. So um, 
you know, the, the editor collaboration is, um, you know, editors, I think, are, are very unsung. Um, you know, they have, they have a, a lot of uh, say in how the story gets told um, and a big hand in that. Um, but as a director, I, I love working really closely with editors and um, trying to get them to understand what I'm looking for the film to say. And we work together to make that happen. Um, so, you know, specifically like with a, with a cutaway and B-roll and things like that, like, and I'll, again, I'll use the May Last example because I, I, probably most of the listeners of, to this podcast have seen it. Um, but, you know, we, we would spend days um, just shooting B-roll um, because we, we wanted to capture a feeling um, of, of what it was like to be in your world. You know, and so I remember being after a day, I think we were shooting with set with Scott at his house and um, it was, you know, about to be like golden hour. And so we ran out into the fields and all those, those beautiful, there's a shot of a, a cat walking around in a field somewhere and just the, the sort of, you know, the leaves falling and grass kind of waving, like the, the, all, all of the, 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 the feeling of the environment was really important. Even in, in Malibu too, we spent, or Mike Martin ran around filming butterflies a lot, you know, in, in slow motion. And, um, but that, that was something that, that, you know, I had said to the guys at the beginning, like, we get, you know, any moment to capture this stuff, we got to take it. Um, and and, and those, those things, sometimes you're just covering up an edit, you know, sometimes you just, you, you just need it because it's a crutch. But sometimes it, it really helps you tell the story. <clears throat> Most of the time it does. And that's, that's, that's what you're looking for, is what are the little details of, you know, in, in your room that you're zooming this from, Bob, like, you know, what's there that might tell me a little bit, some, a little bit of something about you? You know, I'm looking behind you, I'm, I'm guessing your bookshelf would probably tell me something. Sure, about, bookshelves are very are. popular now. Yeah. <laughs> books, people's books. But, but what's on them will say something right. about who you are, you know? Yeah. yeah, So a shot of that before meeting you, be like, okay, this is a guy who's interested in this, that, and the other. Well, I'll tell you, Mike, I, I, I separate my shelves into theology and history. So just so you know, one side of the TV is theology, the other side's history. Um, ben, I got a Zoom question. We had, somebody had a hand up. What does that mean? That's, that, that means we'll, they'll put their hands up for a question uh, when okay. we do the Q&A section. Just, they're just okay. queuing themselves up, so they'll be in, be in order there. Um, okay, I, that's Peggy, Donica, I believe, and... We will get to her yeah, question. And if, you, and if you guys who are listening, if you, there's the Q&A panel. If you want to open a question there, like we'll probably, we'll talk a little bit longer and then we'll get to the Q&A, uh, you know, depending upon how much time Mike has um, and all that. But um, so you can submit them there. So thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question now because um, obviously we can't not talk about, you know, bow notes. Mm -hmm. We got to talk about that yeah, because, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it's that, all right, we watched this like last week. My wife was kind of like, I mean, she's like into sports, right? But like, she didn't really know who Bo Jackson Me was. Neither. And at the end of that documentary, she was like, oh my God, Bo Jackson is amazing. And it's true. And I mean, he is, I mean, like by all those accounts. And I think what's interesting is that like, he is this icon of the time. I, I mean, it must be, first of all, it must be insane to be like, I'm going to go investigate the mythology of this guy and be like, Oh God, it's all true. Except for like, we don't know if he dunked a rock or whatever, but like, it's, it's all true. But obviously when you're, when you're writing, when, you, when you're picking subjects, when you're, when you're going at them, you have to think what resonates with people. And Bo Jackson, I think is a perfect subject for 2012. And I wonder if he would resonate in the same way in 2020, simply because we have, we have spent, we spent so long looking for one person to save us. And that comes up in so many different threads. I mean, we even talked about this with, with uh, you know, the outbreak narrative, right? The idea that like the story that we expect to happen right now with the coronavirus is some researcher is going to make this huge breakthrough. And we forget that it's all these people you've never heard of working day in, day night. And now we've seen, I think, the, the, the faith in an individual with Donald Trump was just everyone desperate. All these people just went all in on him. And now all of us who knew better anyway are joining with all the people who were like, maybe we weren't right about that. And as I said earlier, we're in the middle of a movement that is leaderless. 
So do you think that if you were to tell that Bo Jackson story right now, would it, would it resonate with you the same way? Do you, would you feel as compelled to look at Bo Jackson? And, and I guess the bigger question is like, how much does the world you're inhabiting shape the subjects you choose and the way that you present them? That, uh, very much so. Uh, there's a, a lot to that question, but I'll, the, the first part is, I don't know that if I were making that film in 2020, if I would take the same approach which in 2012, that approach was, um, it, it was very simplistic. It was, it was, what is the idea of this guy? You know, it's, it, and if you, and the title, which nobody ever picked up on, so maybe it's just in, in my own brain, but it was this, you don't know Bo. You don't really know Bo at the end of the movie either. And yeah, that, was, that was on purpose. Because it's not about Bo. It's about the idea of Bo. It's about the right. idea of heroes and what that does to us as people. Um, I'm not a sports fan. I had, I don't follow sports. I still to this day don't, I, I don't watch any sports. I don't play sports. I'm, I'm not a sports guy. Um, making that film made me understand why people like sports. Like I, I, I never got it. And then making that film, I understood it. But when I started work on that, um, I had to decide what, what kind of an approach to take. And so I just read a lot about Bo and I talked to a lot of people um, and before we started filming, uh, who knew a lot about him. And there was something about the way that people would just light up when they talked about it that I'd never seen before. That it was like this, this they, like they were talking about this otherworldly being that, that was not, it was like, like they were talking about a superhero or a, I don't want to say a godlike figure because that, that's not really how people talked about it. But it was just that, that he was like a superhero. And so I decided, let's, let's make a superhero. And that, that's really kind of what it is. But, but it's, to me, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not about Bo. It's, a, it's about what the idea of Bo, what, what seeing somebody do these things that nobody, not only did they not think it was possible, nobody had even thought of. You know, the, the famous thing where he, he uh, is in the outfield and he runs up to catch a pitch and he literally runs horizontally on the uh, against the wall and and who would even think about that we're breaking bats over his head after striking out like it's it just wasn't things that occurred to people and then he would do them and people would say oh, oh my gosh that's something to do and yet nobody can do it but i just saw it happen and i just saw it happen in a way that like that he didn't even seem to notice he was just like that's right, what happened right. well and that was what was so cool about how he carried himself too was that to Bo was, it was no big deal, you know, and that's even cooler <laughs> than if he had acted, like <laughs> you know? And so, so he, there's a, there's a moment in that film and I can't remember if they got, I believe his name is David Housel who worked at Auburn. Um, and he has this, this really lovely older gentleman um, who just had a really sweet way about him, but a very poetic kind of a soul. And, and he, he said something about, how Bo makes us, I'm gonna mangle it. He makes us, makes us dream uh, that the impossible is possible or so, something like that. I'm completely mangling it. But, um, but to me, that, that was sort of what it was about is what is, what is, uh, what does it do to us to see what we believe to be impossible actually occur, you know? Um, and then how do we tell that story? That whole, the whole thing about like, oh, well, did he really dunk, did he really jump over a Volkswagen? Did he do the, it almost doesn't matter. It's that we're talking about it and, and how does that make us feel, you know? And so that's what that movie is about to me. Like I couldn't tell you one statistic about Bo Jackson. While I was making the film, I could, we had to fact check everything and all of that, but I don't know anything. But I, I do know how people react when they think about him. And there's something really beautiful about that, that, that transcends sports and that transcends uh, any particular season or anything like that, um, that's very universally human. And that's, that's what I wanted to make a movie about. I thought that was cool. So, so today, how would you think about that story differently? I don't know. I, I, that's a, that's a, uh, you know, um, I think there's still, there's a place for that kind of thinking, you know, for, for mythology and for, um, for heroes, uh, there, there's, it's important, you know, uh, it, it's how we tell our own story to ourselves. 
Well, so we have an example of it that's current, and there's a question. Austin Sawyer asks a question, and I think this relates. Uh, Peggy and Dale, we will get to your question, but I'm only going to bring this up right now because I think it relates to what we're talking about. Austin writes, Mike, what did you think of The Last Dance? Uh, do you wish more subjects were afforded a 10-part miniseries, or do you think it takes someone as special as Michael Jordan to warrant a 10-hour documentary? Austin, I'm going to ask Mike before he answers your question, that, that's a, a form, uh, the, last dance, the Last Dance to me was a form of myth-making, right? It was, it was solidifying and creating the, le the lasting legacy and legend of Michael Jordan. It's so, produced by the protagonist. Exactly, but but it was a form of myth making. I, I have to confess, I have not seen it. Unlike I'm, I'm like the only person left in America who's not seen it. Um, so okay, cool. So Ben too. All right. Um, it's ama think, it's amazing, by the way. I've, I've, heard, I've heard nothing but great things, and, and I, I just you know for whatever reason, I just I, I haven't I haven't seen it yet. Um, but but I do think that uh, in terms of the, these sort of ten part series and those kinds of things, you know, it all depends on the subject. Um, it's, it's impossible to sum up a person's life in even a 10 part miniseries. Um, you know, it's something that we, that we always struggle with when, when we're trying to tell somebody's story. Um, when I worked with Judd on the Gary Shandling film, that was commissioned as a one part 90 minute thing. And there was just too much to tell. We, we incredible. To, it's a four and a half hours, yeah. you know, um, and HBO let us do that. Um, usually, you, 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 although now it, more and more frequently they are giving these multi-part part, uh, docs more of a chance and they, they have a, a big life. I also think that I've seen a lot of things that I'm like, well, they could have probably gotten that in one part, like sort of repeating. <laughs> so, so let me ask you this, Mike. We, we are living in the age of the documentary in terms of with Netflix, with Hulu, with all these avenues, Amazon, uh, documentaries. There's a documentary about everything yeah. now, right? Of course, there's an Avett Brothers documentary because there's a documentary <laughs> about everything. So... Um, what, what do you, I mean, a guy who, I, re, I remember the early 90s, and I remember when you would stumble upon a documentary, how gritty they were, yeah. right? There was something uh, forbidden about them or something you weren't supposed to be seeing this part of someone's life, right? right? And when you think about the, um, uh, you know, you know the, the guys that you talked about, Joe Berlinger and, and Bruce, um, but uh, the, the Malays brothers, Maisel's, the Maisel's brothers. The Maisel brothers. Like there, there was something about the, the films of the, the documentaries of the, you know, 70s, 80s and 90s, they were, they were rare, right? They weren't as commonplace right. and they, they were more taboo in some ways. So what do you think about this period of documentary filmmaking that you're very much a part of versus, uh, versus the past? I, I think that, you know, we, like you said, we're in a sort of a golden age of documentary. And as somebody who's been working in documentary really since, I guess, 1996, since I'm old, um, it, uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful time. And, and in, in the sense that watching a documentary is a thing that people do now. You know, it used to be a thing that was, it was this marginalized little thing that's supposed to be good for you and nobody really wants to see it. And geez, they're so boring. And there's not, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't an accepted form of entertainment. Nobody watched them. Now, I mean, who hasn't seen The Last Dance? Who hasn't seen Tiger King or, you know, whatever the, the, the latest one is? Or lesser known films, but I think people sit at home with Netflix or whatever, and they say, well, what do you feel like watching tonight? You want to watch an action movie? You want to watch a documentary? You want People didn't used to say, should we go see a documentary? Nobody saw them. When do you, you, know? when do you think that turn happened? And do you think it was industry driven now that we have things like Netflix that actually benefit from having multi-part series and kind of producing? I mean, because it's, it's less expensive to produce a documentary most times than it is to produce a feature film, right? Much, much, much less so usually, usually. So do you think this is an industry driven thing or is this more, I mean... Is this more like we, the way that we change the way we engage information? I, I, th I think it's both. I think the, the big driver, I believe, of this current um, wave of, of sort of premium documentary films and miniseries was probably reality TV, you know, was, was, was the, the, which 
I've never been a fan. Um, some people like it. And, and even just saying reality TV as a whole is lumping in some, you know, real garbage with some good stuff, you know, but, um, but I think that, that the acceptability of that, the idea of seeing real people um, on screen it, it sort of got people used to that form, the idea of a, you know, a handheld camera, um, interviews, the, the, those kinds of basic, you know, the, the techniques that the documentarians have in their toolkits became more frequently used um, in more entertainment driven things. I mean, for, for so long, other than the Maisels brothers and Dave Pennebaker and Robert Drew and a handful of filmmakers, documentary was mostly for education. Like that was kind of what it was for. It wasn't really for entertainment. Um, and slowly, 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 it became something that, that is entertaining, you know? Um, and so it's become accepted that way. And I, I actually, I really do believe that reality TV had a lot to do with that. Um, I've never worked in reality TV, but uh, it, it, it's, um, and I, you know, documentary people like me kind of like tend to sort of frown on it, you know, which I think is not cool, even though I'm one of those you know, snobs that, that frowns on it. But, um, it, you know, I, I think that, that people got used to seeing those techniques and, and they became comfortable with it. And then when you hit them with something that's, you know, using similar techniques, but telling a deeper story and a more truthful story that really resonates. Um, I think it's connected. I, I also think that that the again, like for for so long, it, it was so rare that you would see a documentary that was that, that its primary purpose was to entertain in the way that that a that a narrative feature would entertain. That it was you know aspiring toward art. Um, Usually that wasn't the aspiration. Usually the aspiration was to give you some information. And that's, nobody wants that necessarily, you know, um, it, it, that's medicine. Um, but as, as the art form grew and more and more people um, became able to do it, we started to hear more voices. And, uh, and now it's, again, it's like he said, do you want to watch a documentary? Do you want to watch a comedy? What do you feel like? You know, it's, it's, it's in the mix, you know, which is, which is exciting. So, so this actually blends over nicely with a question that Peggy Donica asked in our Q&A uh, about this question of, you know, what, what affects what you make? She says, uh, or she asks, uh, do you as a documentarian have an ethical responsibility and how do you balance that with your own point of view? Yes, an ethical responsibility in a, in a number of different ways, I think. I mean, I think first and foremost, you've got to be ethical to yourself, you know, um, do you, uh, do you believe in, can you stand by what it is that you're doing? Um, and that not only what you're putting on screen, but the way you conduct yourself with your crew members and everybody that, that you encounter in your subjects. Um, but, you know, you also have to sometimes make difficult decisions about, um, you know, being able to put food on your table and pay your rent and do your work. You know, it's, it's documentary is not a tremendously well-paid gig you know um and so i i've certainly worked on things that i'm like mm, I'm, not, I'm not i'm not proud of that one really <laughs> you know I, I kind of wish that would go away but never anything that um that i really had a, a an ethical problem with i mean i've been approached with projects before that i've turned down because i just couldn't be right with with promoting something um but i've certainly done things just for the money like you have to you know it's like any other job i mean you, you you work because you gotta you gotta work um so uh, i've been lucky in recent years you know as i've sort of been in the business longer and had to you know been able to grow a little bit um that, that i i'm in a position now where, where I, I feel like i can say no sometimes you know if i if i just don't feel strongly about about a subject um so uh but 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 ethics are are, are I mean, the documentary ethics is a whole conversation that, that, you know, to me boils down to some things we were talking about before is, is just being truthful, um, being truthful to what's factually correct and what is honestly a reflection of the people that you're, that you're showing in a film, you know, um, something like the Bo Jackson film. Like I wasn't trying to like get inside Bo's head and really understand what made him tick. I just wanted the bow that he wanted to present on screen. And it was more about what the idea of him, as I said, like what, what, what is the idea of this 
hero do to people? That it provides hope to people. What 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 does that do? Um, and why is that special? And why do we why do we love that? Um, but in the process of doing that, I couldn't say anything uh, untrue about Bo. You know, I couldn't say like, oh, he he gave all of his salary to charity because he was such a wonderful. Like, no, I didn't. You know, so you, you've got to be truthful, factually truthful, but also emotionally truthful, and that's really really important. Uh, Bob, you're muted. You. Gail Martin asks, speaking of May at last, I hoped that the bonus content would include the whole Madison Square Garden show, or really any shows you shot during its making. The cinematography and sound are amazing on May at last. Is there any chance of an Ava Brothers concert film? Is there any chance? Of, well, first of all, uh, let me say um, the I think that's a no, Dale. Garden, getting permission from Madison Square Garden. Um, I was going to say that. Yeah, that was, that was uh, you know, we had to jump yeah. through a lot of hoops. They were great. and They gave us the permission. But um, what's in the film in Madison Square Garden, that's, that's about it, unless we want to, you know, spend a, a, a gigantic amount of money to release that. Um, some of the other concerts, uh, yeah, you know, the thing was, we, we didn't shoot it like a concert film. Um, you know, we didn't shoot it thinking that we're going to need full coverage on every song. Um, so we only had, I think the most cameras we had was at, at MSG. I think we had five. Um, but usually it was three. It was, it was our, you know, that, that film in, in the field, most of the time, almost the entire time, really, it was four of us. It was myself, Jonathan Fermansky, our DP. Mike Martin, our second camera, and Brad Birdbaum, our sound recordist. And it was just the four of us. Um, so at those concerts, like the, the one in uh, it's Columbia, South Carolina, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like that show, um, the show in Rochester that opens the film, um, it was just us. Like there, there, was, there was three cameras, that was it. Um, so even cutting together a whole song is tough. Um, and the way, you know, covering you guys on stage, I remember actually at MSG, um, my wife, who's also a documentary filmmaker, um, but has done a lot of camera work, I, I brought her on to shoot one of the cameras. And I warned her before, I was like, just when they get on, it's, they're, they're really hard to cover. So just hang on a wide shot if you need to, because they go nuts. And she was like, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. And after the show, she was like, you weren't kidding. Those guys, you can't follow them. They're everywhere. You know, the way Scott runs around the stage and, you know. Um, but a, an Ava Brothers concert film, is something that has definitely crossed my mind. Um, and maybe it's something that uh, one day, uh, Bob, we can, uh, we can talk about. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I would to... love that, Mike. Uh, I wanna say, Dale, there are good things coming in the future. And Mike, I would love to make that happen as well. Yeah, let's so, just get the team on, on Dale Martin just brokered a deal here. Yes, <laughs> he uh, you know, and, and, and Mike has already proven he'll work for free. So exactly. several, in several experiences, he works for free over and over again. That's so. what I love. So he, was like, he was like, I told him I'd work for free and they hired me. I was like, I don't know if he hired you so much as like, okay. <laughs> Basically, yeah. no, that's amazing. That's though, the man. only two times I've worked for free. Was, was free. Marshall Hagley asks, as a storyteller, Marshall Hagley is my cousin, by the way. Right. Thank you, Marshall, for being here tonight. As a storyteller, what will be the 2020 story a couple years from now? What will be the theme of 2020? COVID, quarantine, election, police violence, protests, riots, business shutdowns? I don't think there's one. I, I think it's, it, but, but I hope that it's somehow about rebirth, you know, and, and growth. Um, you know, the conversation at the beginning of, of the show where you guys were talking about Black Lives Matter and the, the movement there, you know, that, that is the continuation of what we, you know, I grew up always thinking that America wasn't done, that it was, it, it's, it's an experiment, it's a work in progress. And this current, you know, the, the strength of the Black Lives Matter movement right now and the way that it's captured the world's attention um, has everything to do with the evolution of America and, and what it was intended to be was, was an equal place. Um, it, certainly in, in, in the words it is, if not in practice um, for most of our history. Um, and so I'm, I'm very hopeful in a very dark time that 
especially when you think about the lens of history, I'm hoping that history looks back at this time of real tumult and trauma as a turning point when America got better, when, when, when America figured out a lot of its past mistakes and made right on them. The hard conversations, right? Yeah. The, hard, the yeah. tough conversations that we have to have with one another. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like, uh, you, you know, uh, I don't pick sports teams very well, and I of, often don't pick candidates very well, but as far as winners and losers, but I feel like um, you could bet that 2020 is not over yet, mm-hmm. and it's going to be crazy from here to the end of this year, if not from here to November. Buckle up. It's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> and I really fear we haven't seen anything yet. Wherever your mind can take you, I think that there's a, there's a possibility we're going to go there. So, uh, yeah. Bob Crawford teasing the second half of 2020. <laughs> right now i'm like where do i go where's the link i'll buy tickets to that it sounds very exciting which be that hasn't even started yet what's next godzilla's um <laughs> yeah. Actually, right. can you guys something? As, as historians do you tend to think of of years of individual years or of, of periods really like like because i don't think that 2020 is going to be over on december 31st you know the, this 2020 thing is is it's going to go on Periodization is hard, but there are moments that really that really bring together, right? So, like sometimes we'll talk about we'll talk about a year like sixty eight, nineteen sixty eight is a big year that we talk about because so many things converge there. Um, you know, with the, with the Democratic Party of Vietnam, right? Finding out about you know Gulf of Tonkin, and at the same time King getting assassinated, and and you know Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and you have like sixty eight in Czechoslovakia where the you know where this Prague Spring, and then the Soviets roll in, and there's people in the street in Mexico City. So it's like sometimes there are these moments where everything seems to converge, and that takes on a life of its own. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think mostly, I mean, you know, we still, as historians, like when we talk about it, we have a hard time, like what's the 19th century, right? I mean, that's a hundred years. And we're like, yeah, it begins in 1789 with the French Revolution and ends in 1918 with the end of World War I. And it's like, but what about the American Revolution? Okay, so it starts in 1776. And then the French are like, that was not the real revolution. And we're like, okay, well then I guess that wasn't it. We don't know, right? And what's the 20th century? We define it like end of World War I to the fall of the Soviet Union in 89. So that's, that's always an issue. So I think we talk more in terms of eras, right? And it depends on like what, what's your narrative, right? Because certainly you have an, a global narrative that's, that looks different than an American narrative where 1865 is a point of rupture. Right. Um, and that's what, you know, the way, this is the, the question, and maybe we can end on this because um, this was like something I started to write and I realized you're kind of, Mike, you're like the perfect person to talk, uh, you know, about this with. So the the question about like what is it going to be or like what's the future going to hold it's a question like none of us can answer but historians have been doing a great job of getting out there and speaking and 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 giving historical context but journalists don't really know how to talk to them so like journalists are always being like so what do you think historians are going to think about this in 50 years and the only answer is i don't know that's the only answer all right because nobody actually knows but then i realized that even though as historians we can't answer that question because we don't have the facts as an educator I think I actually can tell you the problem of teaching the Trump era. And the problem is it is defined by an individual who is a terrible protagonist. Think of like all of the things that, that make a great protagonist, right? Like, you know, you compare Hamilton, the guy who comes from nothing and fights his way up and like, you know, gets his own inertia and dies or like Grant, the guy, the rise and the fall. And then the re the rebirth, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, like, the idea that people have these fatal flaws, the idea that they struggle and they come out better, but they're still flawed. All of the things that I hang the narratives on when I teach do not work with Trump because he has no personal narrative or seeming awareness of any type of internal conflict. He see has no narrative that stresses any point of failure whatsoever. He has, there's nothing. He is only, I think as a character, a, 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 a an antagonist, he only, he only defines people in compelling ways when they are in opposition to him. What do you think about that? I mean, as a storyteller in my classes, that's the only way I can imagine it. I think you're absolutely right because he is a two-dimensional character. He, he is just all of these, and, and it, you, know, you sound like, oh, you're just a 
never Trumper or whatever, if you say it, but there's nothing redeeming about him. Not, not one thing, not, not a single thing. The worst people usually, you can say, well, at least, you know, he was nice to his dog. This guy, there's nothing. He doesn't have a dog. He doesn't even have a dog. <laughs> but he, he, he uh, yeah, even Hitler had a dog. But like the, uh, the, the thing that fascinates me about, the, the, about Trumpism is not Trump, it's us. It's how did a guy who would have been the villain, like, you know, I, gr I grew up in the 80s and 90s, like he would have been the bad guy in the movies and we would have despised him. Why do we like him? Not we, but not us individually, but, but a lot of people. How did he, how did that story, and even, you know, I understand the whole The Apprentice and he, this, the boardroom and he's the rich guy, but why do we Reality like, television, right? Well, we didn't like the rich guy as Americans. The rich guy was the bad guy. And the especially in the South, the, Yank, the rich Yankee in the limousine, that's what we talked about with Trey Crowder last week. That guy is quintessentially our villain. He is. And there's something about us that we've decided that this is who we want to represent us. And this is who we identi identify with or um, aspire to be. And, and that, that cruelty is somehow superior to decency um, is very, very troubling to me. I, I, I do think that, that the people who feel that way are in a minority, um, as the last election proved from the, in terms of the popular vote. Um, but, that there's even that large of a segment of Americans that choose cruelty over decency is, is just very disturbing to me. And I, and I don't know what it is that has done that to us and how that happened. That's what's more interesting to me. Than 39 to 47%. 39 on any given week, it's 39 to 47%. Right, right. That's And I think there's, there's, there's a percentage of those people who just say, well, if the economy is fine, I don't really care what he's doing the president doesn't doesn't really matter but if my 401k is okay i'm voting for him but then there's that smaller population and where, where i you know i live in new york city but right now I'm, I'm outside of new york city and i drive around and i see trump 2020 signs all over the place and i always just wonder like what you know oftentimes they're accompanied by a confederate flag so i know what what where that's coming from but in new york there's no heritage so what's left just hey, it, it's it's the, it's the racism flag. Like that's that's what it is. But but the the idea that that this guy who would be the villain, like throughout all of 20th century popular culture and literature and everything, this is the bad guy. This is the guy who was closing the orphanage that the Three Stooges were going to save. You know, like this is this is the bad guy. Why is he not the bad guy anymore? To so many people. To, to lots of us, he is the bad guy, but, but there's a, 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 lot of, a lot of our countrymen think he's, he's the hero. Yeah, um, it's weird. It's, you know, I, I remember like at some point when I got a little bit older, like watching those old Batman shows and kind of this old campy like action shows mm -hmm. and looking back and being like, who the hell is like the, who's the henchman for the Joker? Like, who is this guy in the, in the background with the Riddler? Like the guy who's just like got a Bobo mask on, he's dressed like eight other people and he can't really do much, but he's there, die, like ride or die for the Riddler. And you're like, who would ever do that? And then you're like, oh, it turns out. Eight was just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole lot of people willing to play that role. Right. And uh, that's, where, that's where we are. I don't know. Bob Crawford, did we lose him? Looks like we lost Bob. Did the plan work, Mike? <laughs> we took over the show. It was, supposed to be, it was supposed to be 9.33 when he disappeared, but it was a little delayed. But maybe that was because, I don't know. But anyway, great. I'm Ben Sawyer. I'm Mike Bonfiglio. Welcome to the road to now. America 2.0. I think maybe Bob, he, he looked like he had to leave for something urgent. So maybe we should just wrap. Bob, oh. you're back. Kids. Kids. Mm. We thought you stormed off in anger, Bob. No, yeah. I was, kids. I, I was going to ask you, Mike, and I do believe it's, it's a good time to wrap it up. And Gary, you don't even need to put this in. But uh, why is it? How is it? I got to hear myself now. How is it that, you know, we're, we're mutual friends with um Matt Negrin. Mm -hmm. right? buddies with Negrin? Yes. And uh uh you know you're one of the sweetest people I know and Matt is one of the tenderest men I've ever met in my life. But yet on social media, on Twitter, no! you are 
You are both venomous. Oh. You are both ve I'm not venomous. I'm not as bad as you. I'm not as bad as Matt. <laughs> and, and, you know, and even Judd at times, but it's like, how can these, and I, you know, I do know, like, I just don't respond 90% of the time. I don't respond to, I just look at it and just feel awful and I just don't respond to anything. But like some of the sweetest people I know uh, face to face and in life and on Twitter and they are just, not, not that I don't agree with your larger points, but sometimes you and Matt, and it's funny because I said this to Matt a couple of weeks ago, uh, like you and Bonifiglio, you know, you're so sweet. I, I always give Matt a hard time about this. Always yeah. do. Cause yeah. I get on the phone with him and it just, he's just so kind and sweet and loving. And then on Twitter, he's just so mean and venomous. He's a lot worse than I am. <laughs> here, I, I don't have the candle to Matt. I, I would say with me that, uh, first of all, nobody's listening. I've got like, three followers. It's not, I don't have a, a uh, I'm, I'm always reading your tweets. Oh, yeah? Okay. yeah, two thirds of your follower base right okay. here. In the right now. I have a very, very, very strong sure. follower. But I think there's something about the, uh, the ease of it, that if, 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 if when you get really angry about something, it's, a, it's a, an outlet for anger. Yeah. And so I think the way that I, when I look at, at Twitter, which is really kind of the only social media that I, that I do, and I do it too much, and I, and I need to wean myself off of it but um i i think that there's a there's an immediate anger that when you read something or see something that that just really angers you that it, it's an outlet to release your own your own anger and and things that you wouldn't say or maybe don't even feel in your best self it's this the gut thing um and i also think just as a communication tool those cutting things um, sometimes just break through the noise a little bit. Do you have people that challenge you? That that people that write you and people that block you? Uh, the the only people who blocked me. Well, actually, okay. <laughs> two people that I'm aware of that are blocking. One is Eric Trump because uh, I taunted him about something just out of my silly, you know, whatever. Uh, the other is Dan Bongino, that guy who's on Fox, the angry, roided out guy who's on. Fox News a lot, and I think he's a former Secret Service guy. He was on NRA TV, and anyway, he blocked me. And your upcoming guest, Tom Nichols, who I really enjoyed his, I, I would always read his stuff. I, I, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's a guy who I don't agree with on a lot of things, but agree with on others, and the things I don't agree with, he's very intelligent, and so I, I, I try to understand more about things. He blocked me for some reason. I don't know why. It might have been. And I, I, I don't think I ever interacted with him. I never said like anything. Wow, that's complex. Yeah. Like it's it's complex with um. It's complex. It's not the well, real world. Well, that's Bob it. likes to talk to people about their Twitter behavior. So I do. <laughs> well, I well, you know, well, let me say that I stepped out uh, into it with the person with the Civil War this weekend, and I don't normally. I don't great. normally engage these things, but this is something. I'm sorry. The Civil War is about slavery. <laughs> yes. Don't stop. Yeah. And and he responded. This guy responded to Ben, and you know I got tagged in it. And I just, I had to. I was like, you know what? Because because in the Matthew Carp book, uh, there's a lot of great deal. He covers the secession speeches, you know, that happened in the state capitals but by the Confederates before they broke away, before oh, they yeah. seceded from the Union. And they say a time and again, and you can even get these edit, there's books that like the edited, the secession speeches. <laughs> and so it's like speeches by guys who were arguing in front of their state legislatures that they needed to secede from the Union to protect the right to keep another person who they believed was, not, was inferior to them in bondage and keep them as their property. That they made that argument again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And to say it wasn't about slavery is hogwash. And it seems so it seems so obvious because you're just like, all right, all right, all right, all right. If we wanted to know why they did it, all right, here's two possible ways we could find out. We could go to the people who made the decision and see what they said about it. That would be one source. Now the other source would be your stepdad. So, um, which one do you think is a more authoritative source on this? And I, I don't care. Your stepdad and your uncle were doing it together. I don't care. Like, what do you think? And it just blows my mind. They're 
There is no way, and I will say this definitively, again, at me for real, I'll come on your show, we'll talk. There is no way to go to this evidence, none, with a question mark. What caused the Civil War? What was the root of it? There's no way to go to that evidence and reach any other conclusion that the primary cause was slavery. There's none. And, and I, I mean, I'm, so, I'm so sorry that, that you have to read books that are sometimes boring to learn this stuff. You know, although Matthew Carp's book is not boring, but you got to read dense books to read, to, to get to this stuff, right? You can't, that's why Twitter, a thread doesn't support an argument because you got to really, you got to do your research. You got to learn in order to, to know what is true. But I, I was looking for um, Mark Twain, uh, try, like something's come up that I've been working on and, and uh, I, was, I had to reference Mark Twain for it. And I found this quote and, you know, Mark Twain, he's, you know, man of the people, uh, great wit. Um, and here's the first quote I found yesterday morning when I was looking up Mark Twain. No amount of evidence will ever persuade an idiot. <laughs> oh. It doesn't Cracker, say, that's what Cracker said. Cracker on that feed. Because Joe Kwan sick me on somebody about that Confederacy thing. And then like I was like, all right, I'm coming at it. And then Cracker Farms like, just block her. She's an idiot. <laughs> I was like, and, wow, and it took then, him way less time to respond. And like after like I that. read that, after after I read that that response by Cracker, I read that quote by Mark Twain. <laughs> But I, I live and die by the idea, and I understand. There's also like great clips that you can't reason someone out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. But I don't believe that. Like I have had positions in my life that I didn't reason myself into. They were visceral and I learned better. And you know, if we just give up, then we lose. If we only save one in 100 people by, by coming up with them evidence, we still brought people around and that compounds. Ben, look at my, look at my finger, look at my finger. So look, 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 no, Scott Huffman, pollster, Winthrop, he does the Winthrop poll, right? One of the, one of the foremost pollsters in the South, if not in the country, said that he was told me earlier this year that what he was seeing was when you provided people he was polling, when you provided them evidence contrary to their beliefs, to their implicit biases, it only made them believe their biases and previous beliefs stronger. That's yeah. his polling. But listen, I gotta go. It's 1049. Yeah, we gotta, I should gotta, have been yeah. in bed an hour ago. But I wanna yeah. read two more Mark Twain qu quotes because I, this is, Gary will cut all this out anyway. But why waste your money looking up your family tree? Just go into politics and your opponent will do it for you. Yeah. Mark Twain, everybody. Last one. Politicians and diapers must be changed often and for the same reason. That's all I got. Yeah. Mike, Mike, I love you. Thank you for coming on the show, brother. Great to see you. Great to see you, Ben. Uh, yeah, thank likewise. Thanks for having me. Yeah. This is amazing. Anytime. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you, guys. Uh, Tom Nichols in two weeks. We can ask him why he blocked Mike. Yeah, he blocked me. He's the bottom of that. And then uh, Joe Kwan in July. And Joe Kwan, too, for some reason. I don't know why. Jo yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I got to censor myself. And then um, can we? Heather Cox uh, Richardson, Heather Cox historian, the her brilliant new book, Cox. her new book, How the South Won the Civil War. Mm hmm. Although them statues keep falling, don't they? So we'll see. We're looking for the sequel to that book. So, anyway, great guest coming up. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys, this is yes. super fun. All right, guys. Cheers, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye.